Hello, and welcome to another episode in our Canada Files series. I'm Jim Deeks, and as a lifelong golfer, I'm especially excited to have Mike Weir as our guest on this edition. Mike is arguably the best male professional golfer ever to come out of Canada, and the only Canadian to have won the Masters Tournament, for many the holy grail of pro golf, back in 2003. Having turned 50 last year, Mike quickly joined the PGA's Champions Tour, where he's attempting to turn back the clock and rekindle the glory years. Mike, I'm going to start with a question that some of the interviewers might save until the end, but I want to ask you if there was ever a time when you might have thought over the last few years that the Mike Weir story had already been written, or is there still some achievement to come on the golf course from you? Well, Jim, I, I'm, I, I can't say that it hadn't crossed my mind, but I think the way I'm built is uh, there's not much quit in me. So, um, you know, I have the saying that, uh, that Dan Millman, uh, who wrote the book, The Peaceful Warrior in the book, and, and, and had a movie about it, was, uh, you know, uh, a warrior doesn't give up what he loves, he finds in love in what he does. And I translate that to golf, you know. I never want to give up golf, I love it too much, and uh, passionate about it still at my age. I still love to compete, I still love to practice hard, and I love to play with my friends and enjoy the game. And the state I was at with my game, it wasn't fun. Um, so I just wanted to find that love in the game again and, and bring it back to some semblance so I could enjoy it again. And it's, it's turned into even better than that. Well, the reason I asked that question is because, as you would well know, uh, pretty much since your victory in the Masters in 2003, and I should just explain to our audience who may not be golfers that the Masters is one of four majors on the PGA Tour each year and it may well be the tournament that most pro golfers want to win most. You won it in 2003 and you had a couple of victories after the Masters but from let's say about 2005 there were a number of people particularly in the media who might have said, eh, it looks like Mike's career is kind of going downhill now. Um, but you, Mike Weir, never seemed to subscribe to that theory. You kept fighting back, you kept persevering, and now, uh, perhaps to the surprise of many, you are on the Champions Tour and back in competitive golf. Um, were you angry that so many people did tend to write you off after, say, 2005? Um, I don't know if angry is the word. I think, you know, I think, you know, disappointed maybe. Um, and, but at the same time, you know, I realize that, you know, most people in the media don't, don't know who I am and don't know the, the kind of effort and, and the kind of work ethic that I have, even though, you know, golf, golf's a game that's very fragile and there's many ups and downs. And, um, you know, I've had that since early in my career in the early 90s when I first turned professional. You know, it took me six years to even get on the PGA Tour. I was playing a lot in Asia and Australia and the Canadian Tour and trying to find my way in this game. So I knew what struggle was. And, you know, sure, I reached the pinnacle with winning the Masters in 2003, but I, I never forgot how hard this game was. So when I started having some struggles, um, I know what that's all about. I know how to dig myself out. This last little bout has been harder to dig out of through injuries and a number of things, but um, you know, I, I'm all about that and I'm not afraid to, to dig deep to try to find a way out. Okay, let's go back to where it all began. Most kids growing up in Sarnia, Ontario, which is just across the river from Michigan, just northeast of Detroit, but most kids in Sarnia back in the 1970s and early 80s lying in bed probably weren't dreaming of becoming golf pros much less winning the Masters. Did you have those dreams? Well, I think my dreams were most like kids in Sarnia were uh, in the NHL, you know, <laughs> to, uh, to make it into the NHL to be a hockey player. But I knew quite early on, you know, my, uh, you know, right even before I was a teenager that I knew I wasn't probably good enough to, to pursue a hockey career. 
And we happened to move across the street from here on Oaks Golf Course when I was about 11 years old. And uh, there was a great golf pro there, Steve Bennett, and his assistant, Dave Bedore, and I had a summer job there. And it was a great culture for golf. I mean, there was a lot of kids my age at that time. We, we either worked a shift and then played all afternoon, or we played all morning and then worked the shift in the afternoon, you know, picking the driving range and working in the back shop. Uh, so it was a great culture. We were a very competitive culture at a young age, and we had that from the time I was 12 years old till I was 18. So um, I think people who are watching maybe don't realize how passionate Canadians are about golf. We love our golf when the when, when the, the weather starts turning and the weather starts turning nice, uh, everybody's excited to get outside and it was no different in Sarnia. We were excited to get out and play. I would say, to, yeah, to answer your question, yes, I did have thoughts of, of winning the Masters. I think I was really um, enthralled with golf and professional golf. Jack Nicklaus came to do an exhibition at Huron Oaks in 1983, I believe. Um, and he, they, he played a match with Steve Bennett, our head pro, and they had this little you know, match and I got to see Jack Nicklaus up close for the first time at 13 and then Jack winning the Masters in 1986 at 46 years old um, really sparked my passion for golf and going to the Canadian Open for the first time in those early years. So I think in those years there that's when I started dreaming of um, I love sports so much that you know golf might be uh, the path not hockey. So when did you realize that you actually might have the talent to become a golf pro, much less one able to compete in major tournament golf. Well, I would say, Jim, that, you know, a real breakthrough moment for me actually was in the early 90s. I'm not sure if it was 93, 94. I, I qualified for the Canadian Open on the Monday qualifying. I won in a playoff, got myself in the tournament. And I walked onto the driving range, and there was Nick Price. And there was one little slot. Um, the, Driving range was full and there was one spot empty and it was right beside Nick Price. And Nick Price, I believe, was number one or number two in the world at the time. And I was hitting balls beside him and being left-handed golfer, I'm looking right at him. And just the sound of the ball coming off the club uh, was a lot different than mine. And um, I had aspirations to be that type of player, but I knew, man, I'm so far away from that at this stage of the game. Even though I was a professional golfer, there's different levels of professional golfers. I mean, there's the major champions, there's guys that just keep their cards every year, there's guys that win tournaments but never do well in majors. Um, I was on that lower, lower tier just, you know, breaking through, trying to break through, and I looked at Nick and I'm like, well, what is he doing? And it started my path of exploring um, technique a little bit uh, deeper, um, fitness a little bit deeper, and figuring out a way to, how, how the heck does this guy hit the ball so well and so consistently? Because mine my game wasn't like that, it was very inconsistent. I could have days that were really good, but not every day like a guy like Nick Price. So that was a real breakthrough moment for me to, to watch that and then help me dive deeper into the technique side that helped my game improve. Well, clearly something worked because by the time you, your PGA Tour career was basically finished by the end of the first decade of the 2000s, uh, you had won eight tournaments you competed on the international team uh, in the President's Cup biannual golf exhibition. You beat Tiger himself in the President's Cup in 2007 in a well-remembered match by just about every Canadian. You spent over a hundred weeks in the top 10 of the uh, world golf rankings for male professional, uh, professionals, which is an amazing achievement. Yet you were never a big guy or a particularly long hitter. How did you manage to beat all those guys? I think, uh, well, a few factors. I think my, my consistency, um, you know, my story about Nick Price, I, I started building a game that was founded around consistency because like you said, not being a big guy, I couldn't overpower courses like Tiger or, or Davis Love or Fred Couples and John Daly, these guys that could you know, really take advantage of the par fives and turn long par fours into short par fours and, um, you know, really have an advantage with their length. My game had to be playing out of the fairway, uh, being a great putter, being a great wedge player, um, being uh, ultra competitor, um, not giving an inch. Um, that, that kind of mentality was, was also a key to my success. And um, so that's how I did it. And I think just through consistency and kind of, um, wearing, wearing the, the golf course down just through consistency and repetition and having a great process 
that, uh, that work for me. So let's talk about the Masters of 2003. I think that just about every Canadian over 25 years of age will remember the day that you won that Masters in a playoff. It was really one of the great Canadian sports moments. And those of us who remember it will also remember the fact that you had to sink a very scary seven-foot putt on the final hole just to get into a playoff which you then won, but that was an amazing moment sinking that putt. Have you ever thought of how different your life would be today if you had not made that putt? I, I haven't. I haven't really thought about that. I mean, I guess, um, you know, the way I look at it is I was leading that tournament from the get-go, and, you know, I had to do... Um, you know, it was, it was a strange week. We, we were rained out on Thursday, had to start Friday. So it was, we had to play as many holes as we could Friday, play as many as we could to finish up to catch up to the 54 holes through Saturday. And then Sunday, we were back to a kind of a bit of a normal schedule. But I was leading from the get-go. Um, I felt like it was my tournament. I came to the 72nd hole. You know, my, cut, my first putt came up, you know, like you said, seven, eight feet short. But my mentality was, listen, this is my tournament. I've been leading this tournament from the get-go. I'm not letting it go right here. Um, I've been putting great all week. That's what was kind of running through my mind, and I stepped up there and hit a great putt. So, um, you know, golf's funny. I mean, you can hit a great putt and it can miss too. So um, my life, would it be different? I think maybe in some people's eyes it, it may be different, but in my eyes, you know, I, I feel like I've still had a really nice career. Even if I hadn't won that, that's just kind of icing, icing on the cake. But I think in a lot of, you know, golf circles, um, you know, uh, I think it, it, would, it would have made a difference probably. Was winning that Masters your greatest golf achievement? I think it is. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, definitely the highlight for sure. But there's some close ones that are very memorable too. I mean, I, I think you mentioned the President's Cups. I mean, I have so many memorable moments from playing the President's Cups and team, teaming up with Nick Price and Ernie Els and um, a lot of great players that I've, that I've played with. Those are great memories to me. Winning in Canada, my very first win on the PGA Tour at the Air Canada Championship in 99, you know, holding a long shot um, on, on the 14th hole, holding out and the way the crowd responded and coming up that 18th hole. It felt, even though it was my first win, it felt like a major championship. You know, that was just so special. And, and you mentioned 2007, the, uh, the President's Cup match with Tiger. You know, Tiger was at the top of his game and I don't think anybody gave me a chance except for those closest to me who knew me, that, that I could maybe beat him that day. I remember Peter Thompson, who was one of our captains, who I love Peter Thompson. Um, he said, it's like feeding the, a lamb to the lions, this, this match. And uh, I took that personally. And, um, and we, had a, we had a chuckle and a smile <laughs> after that, because Peter was there. I said, you, you gave me some more uh, you know, fuel to the fire for that match. So it, you know, a lot of great memories in my career. I'm very, very grateful for uh, the way it's gone. Who were some of the players that you most feared when you were playing on the tour 20 years ago? Well, I think, I think when, I, um, you know, when I saw Tiger or Phil or Ernie or Jim Furyk's a heck of a competitor, um, those guys uh, were, were very tough, tough competitors. I looked, uh, if, we, if I was in contention in a tournament and those guys were in the mix as well and happened to be in contention, I knew I had my hands full and I had to, you know, use all of my mental capacity to stay focused on my game. Golf's funny that way. If you get too drawn into what the other guys are doing, you probably won't play so well yourself. So it's your ability to, to keep within your own game and keep your focus yourself. So I knew when those guys were in contention, I had to really bring my concentration level up uh, to a different level, which ultimately brought my game up to another level. You know, so much has been written about Tiger's ability, I guess, to inspire fear in other players when he was, as he always was, at or near the top of the leaderboard. Do you think when you were playing your best in those years, in the early 2000s, that you inspired fear in other players? Um, I've heard that, actually, from, uh, from some other players that I was intimidating to play with sometimes. I think maybe because of I, I would get so internally focused on my own game and not, uh, n not a disrespectful thing, but I really didn't pay attention to what the other guys were doing. And I think um, 
in my, when, when I was at my best, I think I was able to block things out very well, which maybe seemed uh, to other players like I, I, didn't, I would never get rattled. Not to say I've never been rattled, I have plenty of times, but I think um, when I got in that space in my head and got very focused, I, I could get in a, quite a concentration and deep, deep, level, deep state that um, I guess other players found that intimidating is what um, some guys have relayed to me over the past few years. So let's go to the period after 2007 and your last victory, uh, the down years, let's call them. Um, you, you struggled to regain your form after 2007 and also to overcome some injury. And you got involved in a kind of a different technique with your swing. I don't want to get into the details of that. But during those down years, what was your biggest challenge? Was it confidence? Was it continuing to persevere? Was it uh, financial worries? Were they really, really tough years to go through? Well, Jim, yeah, they were very difficult years to go through. I don't, and I don't know if one is tougher than the other, uh, the, some of the things you mentioned there. I would say um, not being able to perform. You know, I tore the extensor tendon on my right elbow when I hit a tree root at Hilton Head um, in the late 2000s. And um, like I said, golf's very fragile. And um, when you're not able to set your wrists like you normally do because you, you have an injury, and then I had to have it surgically repaired and rehabbing that and, and things just never uh, felt the same as, my, as the way I tried to swing the club before. So I had to try to find alternate ways around the limited movement I had in my elbow and my, in my wrist because of that. Um, so that was very difficult. And I could never seem to fall into a technique that um, really felt consistent. So I was having all kinds of problems. And looking back, the one thing I wish I would have done better is take a lot more time off through that injury time. I think I tried to get back a little bit too early. I fell into some bad habits because I was very hesitant trying to hit the ball. Um, and I almost had kind of a flinch at the ball because I didn't want to hit the ground because it hurt. Um, and I think I, I was stubborn. I was, I was too stubborn. I wish I, I, if I had to look back and anything hindsight, I would have just taken maybe a year or, or longer off to, to fully rehab and, and assess things and, and take a step back. Um, I just tried to plow through and that wasn't, that wasn't the smartest thing. But, um, so yeah, you lose confidence with that. You lose, uh, you know, your, um, your ability to connect with your target. You're constantly thinking about your swing instead of playing the game. And um, yeah, things can spiral quickly. Did you ever think of maybe just packing in tournament golf in those years and maybe take a nice club pro job at a, an exclusive country club and you could have lived a very comfortable life based on the career you'd had up to that point? Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, it, it crossed my mind. Uh, is it worth trying to dig out of this hole again to, uh, to persevere and push through this? And the answer was always yes. It was always when I woke up every day, um, you know, some days more excited than others, but most days to get back to work, to figuring it out, um, to, to try to find a way to get back um, and just find a new way in uh, to, um, to the game. If you could take the Mike Weir of 2003 and magically transport him onto the PGA Tour today, how do you think you'd do? I think he'd do very well too. <laughs> I, think he'd, uh, I think he'd still do very well. I do. Oh yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely a, um, a power game. Um, you know, I, I don't know if 2003 version of myself would would um, maybe get to number three in the world like I did, but I think I'd still be a very good player on the PGA Tour. I think I'd be in contention a lot. But the the players, the longer players on the tour now, are 50 yards longer than they were back in 2003. I mean, I think of the 18th hole at the Masters in 2003, you hit a four iron into the final green. Today, players are hitting nine irons and wedges. I mean, it's, that's a huge difference. And I, I wonder if you think that the quality of the players, particularly the longer players today, is it hurting the game of golf because they're making, theoretically, they're making the golf courses shorter with the length that they're hitting the ball? I think the uh, 
the quality of play on the PGA Tour is even higher. It's a higher standard than what it was in, in my days in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. The long players now, there's so many of them, but they hit the ball very straight. And it's a, it's a function of you know, the technique evolving better on the PGA Tour. The players are fitter, they know how to train smarter and, and save their bodies instead of you know, the old school theory when I was, was growing up was dig it out of the dirt, hit tons of balls. Uh, you really had to you know, overwork almost. And now the guys are working much smarter, but but gaining a lot more because they're they're working um, with their coaches and their biomechanic experts and how the body moves so much better. And then they, and then you throw in the equipment being better, you have these these incredible athletes that are hitting the ball incredible distances, but hitting it very straight. So, yeah, the second part of your question, yes, I worry about the the length of golf courses. The the I think the skill of the game is being able to hit all the shots in the bag. Your driver, long irons, wedges, having hit touch wedge shots, putt great, um, you know, and having to hit fairways. I think, you know, a good example was the U.S. Open this year, where a couple of top players, you know, um, Bryson DeChambeau won the tournament, but Matthew Wolf, another player, they, I believe, on Saturday and Sunday, they hit less than, you know, 30% of the fairways, and they're shooting, you know mid 60s at a, at a very difficult golf course. I don't think that's the way the game should be played. I think, you know, if you're missing fairways like that, you should be penalized. Um, if you hit it long and straight, you should be rewarded. But if you're missing fairways, you shouldn't still be able to hit a wedge on the green and, and score really well. So uh, there's, a, there's a fine balance that the USGA, RNA um, need to figure out here. Is there a golfer in history that you would have liked to have been? Boy, there's, there's a few I wish I would have been able to play with, um, for sure. You know, I, I had a chance to play with Jack Nicklaus a couple times. Jack, as I mentioned earlier, you know, came and played at our home club when I was very young. And Steve Bennett, our head pro, was, you know, loved Jack Nicklaus. So I, I love Jack Nicklaus, and uh, um, he never disappointed, you know. Uh, anytime I've been around Jack, I know his sons well. Played a lot of mini tour golf and some qualifyings for the PGA Tour with his sons and he and Barbara were always out there following their sons and Jack's a guy that I've always really admired uh, the way he's been able to be the best player in the world but have a great uh, balance in his life with his family so he's one and one one person I've always kind of uh, had a kinship with and and read a lot of books about him is Ben Hogan you know a a smaller guy that kind of dug it out of the dirt that uh, didn't have a lot growing up um, had some hardships and uh, was just gritty and tough and found a way to get it done. So I've always admired how he, uh, you know, went about his game. And, and uh, so those two guys, I think, are two guys from the past that, uh, that I'd really admire. Arnold Palmer, well, of course, you also, too. I mean, I love Arnold Palmer. Of course, Arnold Palmer, just about everybody would, would want to have been Arnold Palmer. But back to Jack for a moment. You also have a little personal history with Jack, going back to when you were age 11 or 12 or something. Tell us that story. Well, yeah, that, that first experience, um, I think my first Canadian Open that I went to as a junior golfer to go watch, I was 12 years old. So I got to see Jack, I got to see Johnny Miller, I got to see Tom Kite and all these great players. And I'm like, man, this is, this is cool, but there's no lefties. There was no left, left-handed players. And so my dad and I came up with this great idea to write Jack Nicklaus a letter and ask him, should I switch to right-handed? I'm young enough, I'm 12 years old, should I switch to right-handed if I want to be, become a professional golfer? So I wrote, he was writing for Golf Magazine, I believe, at the time, so I wrote a letter to Jack Nicklaus in care of Golf Magazine, and I got this letter back a few months later saying, no, Mike, I've always believed that you know, you should, if you're a natural lefty, you should stick to that. And um, so. Yeah, it's a great story. I've showed, I brought the letter to um, the Muirfield Village when Jack hosts the Memorial Tournament, and I showed him the letter. And over the years, we've got uh, a real kick out of that. And he's like, "Boy, what would happen if I would have told you to switch to uh, to right-handed? You could have been, you know, no one maybe would have heard of you." So um, we always we always get a kick out of that story. So he can take full credit for your for your career, basically. Yeah, basically, yeah. Mike, I want to ask you a question that I ask all our guests on Canada Files. And in your case, you've played with and competed against and traveled to many, many different countries around the world and played with international players. 
You now live basically full time in Salt Lake City, but you're still proudly Canadian. What does being Canadian mean to you? Well, being Canadian, what it means to me is um, there's just a tight knit uh, camaraderie amongst us all, all of us Canadians. Um, I remember when Bianca Andreescu won the US Open and was competing against Serena. Even though I'm here in Salt Lake City, I have a Canadian shirt on, I'm watching the tennis on the TV, I'm cheering her on, and I think we just have that amongst us. Even if we're in different parts of the world, we cheer each other on. Whether the World Juniors were just on in hockey, I'm watching that, uh, cheering the, the young fellows on. Um, we just have that uh, real pull and camaraderie with one another, and that just feels really special. That's, that's what I feel like being Canadian. We cheer for um, each other uh, very strongly, so it's a really special feeling. Well, Mike, you've been a fine representative of Canadian sportsmanship and Canadian achievement. Thanks so much for joining us on Canada Files today. Thanks, Jim. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time with more Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Michael and Mary Ellen Hogan, as well as the following donors. The Browning Watt Foundation, Nona MacDonald Heeslip, Joe and Marie Heffernan, Donna and Richard Ivey, Alice and Ted Kernahan, Richard and Gail McGraw, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, the North Pine Foundation, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the 63 Foundation, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.